Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Joker Rogers at Channels Television here in Lagos and I'm joined by Vincent McCorry from The Voice of America in Washington, D.C. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCorry at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Joker Rogers in Lagos brings you that story. Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, says the federal government can achieve a $1 trillion economy by the year 2026 by fostering a healthy, collaborative relationship with the private sector. He made this known at the 29th Nigerian Economic Summit, organized in alliance with the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning in Abuja, the nation's capital. The National Economic Summit a yearly gathering of government representatives and high-level private sector leaders is on again for the 29th edition. It's a platform to dialogue on Nigeria's economic management. This year's edition, with the theme, Pathways to Sustainable Economic Transformation and Inclusion, comes at a time the nation grapples with numerous challenges and the need for urgent reforms. Representatives of the National Economic Summit Group highlight necessary steps to kickstart Nigeria's journey to economic transformation. A macroeconomic stabilization program supported by an aggressively scaled national security effort to halt all forms of syndicated and organized crime around crude oil and solid minerals. Without a willing government at the center of the events, this will not be possible. Today, Mr. President, you sit at the helm of affairs as a willing reformer, sir, and we believe that our nation can get to a $4 trillion economy by the year 2035. The event was declared open by President Bola Tinubu, who acknowledged the economic challenges currently faced by Nigerians. He outlines the plans by his administration to bring a solution to these challenges. Consistent with our commitment to enshrine fairness and the rule of law in our country, this government will help hold the sanctity of every legitimate contract, specifically as it relates to foreign exchange obligations of the government, all the forward contracts that the government has entered into will be honored. The framework has been put in place to ensure that these obligations are met in due course. My government is not blind to the challenges several of you are facing in the financial markets. Relatedly, the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Atiku Bagudu, says the ministry has commenced the process of the review of the National Development Plan. We are faithfully committed to the implementation of plans, including the Agenda 2050, because it is an irreducible minimum of commitment to some consensus by all, especially in a federal setup like Nigeria, which you have always believed but which you have always led that should be recognized as such. A panel session follows where speakers deliberate on issues like foreign exchange, government's plan for investment and growth, food security, amongst others. The National Economic Summit, organized in collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, through impactful dialogue, seeks to inspire confidence in the Nigerian economy to drive job creation and fulfill Nigeria's economic potential on the global stage. Joining us to discuss this is development economist Gospel Obele. Glad to have you today on Africa 54. Thank you for having me. Really great to be here today. Right, so the economic summit has come and gone. Uh, what do you make of this year's edition and all the issues that were thrown up? Well, um, it's um, fair enough, a very good start in context to, you know, the first economic summit the president himself, you know, has had to attend. It also, also being the fact that, you know, it's a new administration. Um, safe to say that there was so much on the table to talk about, um, but then having his presence there, his commitment and facilitating those conversations sort of, 
uh will i use the word support the confidence required you know being the state of the nigerian economy today however that doesn't take away the fact that lots of work still needs to be done all right being the being the current context of the nigerian economy main inflation the effects and all of the like so so much work still needs to be done but as, as its presence and uh, the way the conference went in terms of conversations really sparked lots of hope and confidence um in the new administration at the very least Right, and now the president, you know, Bola Tinubu now has, you know, he can rest now and continue with his work with uh, the Supreme Court ruling that affirmed his victory in the February 25th uh, uh, presidential elections. Uh, so the federal government now can work towards its target of $1 trillion economy by the year 2016. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that's, you know, it's a huge task, if I must put it that way. Uh, how feasible do you think this is? Well, it's a very huge task, to be very honest. Um, it is feasible on the grounds of if the right investments, if the right institutional ideology to start with, if the right policies and structural reforms, very hard structural reforms are being rolled out. And also, you know, build a form of sustainable pathway to to, um, uh, to secure prosperity for the future all right so it's very possible but with the current trajectory we're headed it's almost you know uh, sounding like an audacious you know uh, goal in context to you know exactly how policies are being rolled out at the moment so there has to be a change of political behavior towards how the economy is being managed and there has to be a change of strong ideology towards you know placing the people first there has to be a change in terms of prioritizing the non-all sector you know facilitating the organization of market in the service sector as well you know facilitating human capital as a frontier of of global growth and development as and, and nigeria being a, a critical chunk nigeria holding a critical chunk of that of that advantage as it were so that's to be a shift of many things you know lots and lots of structural reforms has to happen uh we need to move agriculture from a crop production based to a value processing base we need to industrialize you know and all of that so um we need to unlock you know new streams and access to market for smes and non smes who can export or who are export ready you know to start with so lots and lots of things have to happen structurally then using policies to drive for sustainability and ensuring that industrial ideologies that govern this concept are sustainable and put the people first Right. So one of those policies, I must say, is, you know, uh, that the, the new government is, you know, gearing, it's trying to make work as the forex uh, market, of course. Uh, everybody's in the need of dollars. You just mentioned uh, people need to, you know, go into agriculture. They need to do a lot of things uh, to for those who are into businesses. And so the president says that, you know, Nigeria should expect about 10 billion dollars to clear the forex backlog where do you see the source of this funds coming from and what can be you know the cost implications on the economy well um and, uh, there are different conversations happening at different level and um, leveraging relationships you know restructuring loans and uh, all of those targeted um uh, um uh, social interventions, as it were, you know, as as forced to, you know, uh, 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 relax the cost of living or FX pressure on the Nigerian economy. For me, I do not think that's a very sustainable approach. However, that approach is good enough as a necessary condition to sort of, you know, gain relief in the medium term, in the short term, rather. But the, the the challenge, you know, to Nigerians' FX problem are largely very structural. All right, and until we begin to think of long-term structural reforms, we may not be able to achieve both the necessary and sufficient condition um, um, approach to dealing with our problem. So, take for instance, there is need for us to ensure the Nigerian economy is productive. There is no country in the world where you have, you know, strong currencies and 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 you and you can't find production, right? It goes hand in hand. A productive economy would always lead to, you know, an economy with a stronger currency edge. And once you have that lockdown, I mean, once you have a productive Nigeria, productive economy, and you can facilitate improved appetite for made in Nigerian products, 
I, I mean, and when I say made Nigeria proud, I mean also sort of disincentivizing, you know, uh, or attracting Nigerians to what's made in Nigerian products, ensuring that the quality and quantity of what we are producing meets global standards or even surpass them. And of, of course, you know, leading up onto the sufficient conditions, which will mean that we are we are managing our currency with the right institutions, you know, with the right people there. You know, there is a strong alignment to the fiscal and monetary authorities and, and all that. You know, all of these things come together to strengthen the local currency. And once you begin to strengthen the local currency and you know lead more export-related programs or initiatives, you get to a point where you can secure supply, you get to a point where you can also relax demand for the FX um, as it were. I think lots of structural reforms, I agree with the IMF, and lots of institutional reforms also have to happen. And um, uh, ensuring that you know lots of local stakeholders are involved in the process. And like I mentioned initially, the ideology driving these reforms have to be more inclusive than extractive. Until these ideologies are inclusive, GDP growth will not yield to more jobs. You know, not the, not just more, more jobs. You know, we're talking about productive jobs in context. You know, you also need to think about the informal sector. How do you begin to encourage more young people to play to to, to find new expression for themselves? How do you balance out? The goal is not necessarily to make the informal formal, but to begin to define productive work even from the informal uh, uh, um, sector bits and pieces, and from there we can take it forward. Right, development economist Gospel Ovele, thank you for your time today on Africa 54. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24 7 on voaafrica.com. After the break, with Cameroon separatist conflict now in its sixth year, a trauma healing center near the capital finds itself overwhelmed with requests for help. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Cameroon's separatist conflict, now in its sixth year, has left thousands of people dead while an estimated two million survivors struggle with emotional wounds. In Bafosam, the capital of Cameroon's region, a trauma healing center is overwhelmed with requests for help. And Zenkyu has the story narrated by Moki Edwin Kinseka. Every other week, Aminatu Musa goes to a speech therapy session organized by the Mission 21 Trauma Healing and Resilience Center. She's in her third session and still can't talk without crying. In 2018, Musa and her husband fled the conflict between government forces and separatist militant groups in Western Cameroon, heading for Nigeria. But along the way, she says her husband fell ill and died. Musa says that for nearly a year, she has not been able to sleep. Most of the times when I come to center, most of the time when I come to the center, I feel better. When I come to a meeting like this and I go back, I'll sleep a bit. After a while, the sleep will just disappear again. The healing process begins with therapy in groups of up to 20 people. After that, therapists hold individual sessions with patients. Mission 21, a Swiss non-governmental organization, also organizes home visits. The center offers material assistance, but therapist Esther Mokong says that kind of aid is of limited help. If you give me a business when I'm hurting, I will not do anything with that business. So when you heal me first and I'm fine and I'm relaxed, I can now be able to do something. When Vanessa Ngang was 20, the crisis began and her husband was killed by the separatists. She spent five years battling illness and unemployment. So would they will fine. I feel good. I learned a new skill and graduated. They opened my sewing shop. I thank Mission 21 for this initiative to care for people. From time to time, I still have memories of the past, but I am fine. Country coordinator Togo Lumumba Mukong says Mission 21 conducts about 120 counseling sessions per month, but demand is three times as high. We think that we, as Mission 21, we cannot do anything without others. 
So we need local NGOs, we need even the willingness of the IDPs to work with us, and then we put our hands together, then we can all come out of this trauma, which is ongoing. According to the UN, Cameroon's separatist conflict, now in its sixth year, has left thousands of people dead, while an estimated two million conflict survivors are seeking help to continue their education or find work. For Anne Zwanke in Bafusam, Cameroon, Moki, Edwin Kinzaka, VOA News. The federal government and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, have renewed a commitment towards attaining food security in the country. Speaking at a meeting in Abuja, Mrs. Dede Ekwe explains that its programs across selected states are impacting farmers positively. Participants drawn from the nine participating states of the Value Chain Development Program, an intervention of the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the federal government, are converging on this hall to assess how the lives of smallholder farmers and their communities are improving across the value chains of rice and cassava. Food security, job creation, and agricultural productivity is the major target of the program. It is imperative that we work collectively to ensure sustainable food system and improve the livelihood of the target community. The CDP, as I was saying, has achieved through the year notable milestone. It has made substantial impact on the lives of rural community in the nine states where the project operates. So far, over 11,000 direct and indirect jobs have been created with production and increase in yield receiving a boost. This vision aligns with the present administration's vision to tackle hunger while ensuring food security. A new ideas that will help us to achieve the programs of the, to achieve the objectives of the programs as stated in the program objectives, which is to the benefit of our small holder farmers. And this is coming as a very critical time because of the challenges that we are having in the country, especially with regards to uh, food inflation, food security. And it's not only in Nigeria, it's not country specific because it is world over. The contribution of the project to Nigeria's food security is undeniably with significant, is undeniable, with significant contributions to rice and cassava production. Moreover, the mainstreaming and commitment of gender and youth inclusion is evident through job creations, skill development, and income generating opportunities for women and youth. The Value Chain Development Program cuts across nine states. They include Nasarawa, Kogi, Benue, Taraba, Enugu, Anambra, Ebonyi, Niger, and Ogun states. It's time now for a short break. As we do, remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channelsweb. And still to come, Nigerian community in South Africa addresses matters that affect them in the diaspora. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Giraffes are considered an endangered species, and in Kenya, the population of the world's tallest animal is on the decline. Officials say four to five giraffes are being lost daily due to relentless poaching for meat and the harsh realities of climate change. Conservationists warn that the rare Somali giraffe found only in Kenya's northeast is heading for extinction without urgent action. Ahmed Hussein reports from Wajir County, Kenya. At Sabuli Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya's Wajir County, a group of reticulated giraffes, also known as Somali giraffes, gather. Conservationists say the rare Somali giraffe found mainly in northern Kenya is trending toward extinction. It is going under very, very uh, loud extinction because there is highly, you know, giraffe at this moment is facing um, many threats, the biggest being poaching, commercialized poaching in Wajia County and beyond. Um, it's also facing 
the effects of climate change, severe drought. More than 70% of the giraffes in Kenya live on community land rather than national parks or game reserves. According to a 2021 National Wildlife Census report, there were nearly 20,000 Somali giraffes in Kenya. But conservation is worn. The number is on the decline. I believe the government and other partners should support community-led initiatives to conserve wildlife. In a bid to protect the giraffes, officials from the Kenya Wildlife Service, KWS, have intensified anti-poaching patrols in the bush and at water points in rural areas. Most of the giraffes are affected by uh, subsistence and commercial poaching within Wajia, which has really affected. But uh, the, as a service, we are doing all corner summits and we will contain uh, the menace. This year, Kenya is celebrating its annual World Giraffe Day in Habaswain town. Conservationists and government officials have gathered here to educate the public on the importance of protecting wildlife. Experts warn the need is great. We are creating awareness and sensitizing the community around our year on the relations and coexistence with the giraffes and other, any other wild animals that might be around and how they can benefit. According to the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, giraffe numbers have plummeted by around 30% since the 1980s and only 117,000 giraffes remain in the world. Conservationists like Sharmake remain hopeful that rural communities in Kenya will heed the call to protect the giraffe and other wildlife. Ahmed Hussein for VOA News, Wajia, Kenya. Recently, the Nigerian community in South Africa convened in Santon, Johannesburg to deliberate on matters that affect them in the diaspora. The event, which brought together eminent speakers, academics, and influential community personalities was organized by the Nigerian Lives Matter group in collaboration with Nigerian Spice. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Simosa, reports. It was another opportunity for the Nigerian community in South Africa to ventilate on issues impacting them. Speakers highlighted Nigeria's rich and diverse cultural history, emphasizing the challenges that arose from its colonial past. The name Nigeria, we have just the name Nigeria comes from, who conceptualized the name Nigeria. How do we come together as a country? We need to realize it is always important for us to have historic perspective when there's a problem in a particular country. This is a new, this is the first one. It's coming in series and we continue doing it because Nigerian Life Matter, Nigerian Spies is just a movement. The conference didn't just focus on the challenges, but also proposed possible solutions to achieve the One Nigeria. We need to call people accountable for their offenses. I believe that if you see a Nigerian doing wrong, you take it to the consulate. The consulate should deport him. You should not wait for the South African government or the South African police to arrest him. We should be able to report ourselves to the consulate and get the consulate to deport the person. We can't continue to sit down here with crime and cover up for them. We should see beyond ourselves. We should start looking for the qualities in what qualities would you like to see in a leader? Do I see it in that man, irrespective of his ethnic group? And if I see it in that man, I support him. That's where it should be. And it means I respect you. Well, for now, the dialogue continues. And the dream of uh, United Nigeria and the diaspora remains a work in progress. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa. Researchers at the Oregon State University have developed a process that uses polluted water to produce hydrogen while purifying the water at the same time. Viewers Julie Tabo reports on advances in the fossil fuel alternative. From powering our vehicles to generating electricity for our homes and businesses, Green hydrogen is a clean fuel that's increasingly being used as an alternative source of energy in a variety of industries. Most hydrogen comes from a chemical process using natural gas, which generates a lot of carbon dioxide. By contrast, green hydrogen can be produced by renewable energies, such as wind or solar power, without carbon emissions. 
It can be extracted from both freshwater and seawater. And now, researchers at Oregon State University have developed a system to produce hydrogen from herbicide-tainted water, commonly found on farms, while purifying the water at the same time. Water um, is essential for life, but consuming contaminated water can have severe effects on our health. For farmers, for example, this technology can be used and so they can purify water while at the same time they can use hydrogen to power something in their farms. Such as farm equipment. The United States is taking a bold action to put our energy sector on a path toward net zero emissions by no later than 2050. Clean hydrogen is central to the Biden administration's efforts toward a cleaner energy future, as more and more countries explore hydrogen as an alternative fuel source. One of the main reasons is countries are recognizing that in order to meet their climate goals, they're going to need a carbon-free molecule such as hydrogen. Hydrogen really offers that versatility uh, for multiple applications. That is what's driving innovative hydrogen initiatives in the public and private sector as an alternative fuel source for the future. Julie Tabo, VOA News, Washington. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember that ChannelsTV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Jocker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.